So who am I? Pastor Garlinda Price with Common Ground Ministry. So uh, listen, I initially had my book out and I was going to teach about the blood of Jesus Christ, right? But it was going to take too long and my phone is going to die, right? So I was like, okay, Lord, what are we going to talk about? And so when I went upstairs to get something, the Lord said, I want you to talk about when I was tempted in the desert. What comes after temptation? I didn't get to change the title on the screen, so you have to forgive me, right? So the Lord said, I want you to share about temptation. So for those of you that don't have my books, just FYI, side note, that sale ends on the 28th. So in two days, right? So is it two days? Yeah, two days. So if you want the books, I have them where it's $20 off if you purchase both or they're individually discounted as well. So get the books there at garlandaprice.com. But don't miss the discount, $20 off. Okay, so I get sidetracked. So Satan tempts Jesus in the desert. I'm going to be coming from Matthew 4. Let me make sure you can hear me. Hey. Okay, so Matthew 4, verse 1. So the question that, um, if, if I would for a topic, right? What happens after temptation, right? After Or what happens after you come out of a season of, of um, temptation? Or that's not the word I'm looking for. What happens when you come out of a wilderness season? That should have been my title, right? So what will happen when you come out of a wilderness season? What will you possess? Glory to God. So this is what had happened, right? So Matthew 4 and 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. So sometimes when it's time for us to go through our wilderness experience, right, we think, oh, the devil is so busy and we give him so much credit for everything with his ratchet self. But it said Jesus was led by the spirit. So how do we know that sometimes when we have to go through our wilderness experience that we're not being led by the spirit, right, for God to work some things out in us. So let's see where we are here with Jesus. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, right? The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So right there, Jesus was like saying, whatever, yes, I am hungry, right? He, well, he probably wasn't hungry because he was Jesus, but he was led by the spirit into the wilderness into the desert. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. People will question whether or not you are a daughter or a son of God. If you're this, do that. If you're that, do this, right? Isn't that the enemy? Isn't that like the enemy when, when you claim to be a believer? Well, if you're a believer, do this. If you're, if you're a believer, where's your God? If, if you're a believer, why hasn't your God done this for you? That's the enemy, right? So today we're talking about what can you expect and what great things come out of a wilderness experience because it's not fun going through through hello i assure you hey sean right so we're in matthew 4 verse 4 jesus answered so what is our reply when the enemy tries to tempt us what is our because god doesn't tempt the enemy does right what is our reply when the enemy tempts us he said it is written right so one way to overcome the enemy the only way i'm not gonna say one way the only way to overcome the enemy is to tell him what's written in the word of god right because the only thing that he understands is the word Right, because we're powerless over the enemy in our own flesh, but we're not powerless as it relates to Christ. Amen. As it relates to the word of God, as it relates to praise and worship, he only understands the word. So we have to use the word as a weapon against him. So this is what Jesus was doing. He said, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. So I'm not worried about whether or not I have anything to eat. It says that, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, and we talked about it earlier this week or either last week, and we said that um, God said that his word, when it was, it, he would send his word, his, when he sends his word out, it would accomplish that which he set it out to do. It would not return to him empty. What does that mean? Whatever the Lord sent his word out to do, it will not come back to him void. It will come back having accomplished that which he sent it out to do. So Jesus is telling the enemy in Matthew 4 and 4, man does not live on bread alone. I'm not worried about just eating, right? Because I live on the words that come from the mouth of God. We live on the words that come from the mouth of God. Amen. Hey, Sora Renata. So what are you saying, preacher? That means that I don't have to worry about whether or not I have food, clothing, or shelter. Those are my basic needs that God said would be provided for. But I know that I can trust that I'm living on the word of God. I'm living on whatever God said out of his mouth if that settles it. It is so and it's going to take place because that's what the word says, right? So how do we defeat the enemy? Tell him it's written in the word. 
Glory to God. So then in Matthew 4 and 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And doesn't the enemy do that right? He took him to church. Now he took him to the temple, but the Lord, the enemy tries to take us. The enemy tries to take us to church. If you are this, cast the devil out that person. If you're that, speak in tongues and heal that person. If you're so great of a believer, if you're so great of a Christian, go do that in the temple. Go do that in the church, right? Because he's trying to get us to doubt who we are, but we don't doubt who we are in God. So what did Jesus say to him? He said, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You won't even stump your toe. Glory to God. So I don't need to throw myself down from anywhere. I don't need to do any harm to myself because the angels have been given command over me. Glory to God. The angels have been given command over you and everything concerning you, the angels have already been given command. You're not even going to stumble. Glory to God. I remember this lady called me um, a prophetess of God. She's so wonderful. Shout out to her. She's not on Facebook, so she won't hear my message if I shout her out. But she said, Garlinda, she said, be aware of darting spirits. And I was like, what is a darting spirit, right? And I would think that I would see things running across the road at night, especially when you're driving late at night. And she and you know, sometimes you're like, did I see something? You know how if you've been driving on the road or you're on your way home and you think you're just tired. She said, Garlinda, even if you trip or if you stumble, she said, rebuke it. Right now, that may seem a little holy to some people. If you're just joining us, we're in Matthew 4, and we're in Matthew 4 and 6. Right, that may hey, Angelina, I love you. Hey, Devon. So, that may seem a little holy roller for some people, right? But the end, but the word of God said, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. That means that the angels will not allow me to stumble. So therefore, if I'm tripping or stumbling, I need to be rebuking the enemy. That's what she was saying to me, right? Take it for what it is. I don't know. So Matthew 4, 7 says, Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. See, some people test God jumping out of airplanes. Now, if that's your job, that's your reasonable service, respect it all the way, right? Some people dive to the bottom of the ocean with tanks on their back. You're a Navy SEAL, respect your hustle, right? But if you're just a regular person doing crazy random stuff, right? That's tempting God. That's testing God for no reason. I'm just going to go climb the side of Mount Everest. And I'm not knocking people that want to do that. But Jesus said, this is what Satan said, throw yourself down for it is written. This is what Jesus said back to him. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him and said, it is also written, so this is what we should be telling the enemy when he's trying to tell us to do stupid things or trying to whisper that something's not going to work out or he's trying to tell us and test us to do things that we know just don't make sense, right? Or trying to bring back old temptations, old ways, old behaviors, past thoughts, past people, past things. This is what we need to be telling him the same as way the Lord was telling Satan. It is also written. So not only is it written, also it says, right? Because you're trying to figure out how to defeat the enemy. Defeat him in the word. Y'all, this Bible, I'm ready to hold it. looks a hot mess, right? But he's defeated by the word. He's defeated by the power of our testimony. When we don't hide behind the sin and the shame of the things we've done and been through, he's defeated by that. It says they overcame by the blood of the lamb. I was going to teach on the blood, but we didn't have time today. And the power of their testimony. Right? So when I tell people, yeah, I did that. Garland, remember, I heard you did. Yeah, I did it. Right? Depending on who it is. Yeah, I did it. Right? Because the enemy is powerless when you say there's no sin, there's no shame. It has no hold on you. Right? So the other thing is, he said it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Some people test God. Right? They're out here driving 150 miles per hour, racing up and down the highway. That's testing God for no reason at all. It makes no sense, right? I'm just talking. So in Matthew 4 and 8, it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Right? So the enemy will show you such greatness, such riches, just such beautiful things, right? And say, the same as he said to the Lord, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Some people have done it. Some people have bowed down and said, I'm going to worship the devil because I want what he has. And they don't realize it's just a fugazi, right? That's like a, a, a movie term, right? It's fake, right? But some people believe because the enemy comes as an angel of light, they don't realize that it's not God. 
right? They don't discern that it's the, that it's the enemy and that he's promising them things that he will, he never plans to give them. Glory to God. So here it is in Matthew 4 and 8. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Well, you may be wondering how could Satan offer the world to Jesus? How could Satan offer the world to Jesus? Because Adam, the first Adam, gave it up, right? When they sinned in the garden, they basically gave the enemy rule and reign, which is why God sent his son. Amen? So here it is. He's offering him, I'll give you everything if you bow down and worship me. My, my daddy owns it all. What do I need to worship you for? You got kicked out of heaven, right? But we don't think about the enemy that way. We don't talk to him that way. You got kicked out, right, by one angel, it's not like it took a whole legion to cast you down out of heaven. They bound you up in chains, one, and kicked you in the back and threw you down here with us. Thank you, Michael, right? <laughs> but it took one to put you out. But guess what? The word will put him out. The word will put him out of our lives. We don't even have to try to chain him up in our own strength. We don't even have to try to bind him up with our own words. All we got to do is go to the word of God and say it's written, and it is also written. This is what the word of God says about you. But instead, when he starts reminding us about our failures and reminding us of our sins and reminding us of our hurts and reminding us of our pain, we don't take authority and say, but hold on. Therefore, in Romans 8, therefore, there is now no condemnation of those who are called according to Christ Jesus, right? We don't start telling him, but it's written over here, right? That he will command his angels concerning me, they'll lift, that they will lift, my, um, lift you up in their hands so that I would not even dash my foot against a stone, right? What is man that you're mindful of him? I made him for my good pleasure. We don't turn around and tell the enemy, but I knew what the word said. I know I did those things. That's true, I did, Right? But I repented for those things. I asked for forgiveness for those things. I even forgave the person that did it, right? But you want to keep coming and remind me. But instead, what we do is we then, some, sometimes people, I don't want to say we, sometimes people sink into a depression because the enemy starts messing with their mind and reminding them of the things they did, right? I remember this morning I was getting ready to go walking and the enemy started trying to remind me of times that I missed out when Miriam was little, right? Because I was selling real estate. I had just gotten started and all the times I had missed, I missed Caleb's first step because I was working at the time when I had him and my mom was keeping him. And those things, you know, they used to bother me. They would keep me up all night crying, not all night, but I'd be up crying. I'd cry myself to sleep for mom guilt, right? But this morning I said, you know what? When he tried to remind me, well, the word says this, I have today and tomorrow has enough worries of its own. So I don't need to worry today about what happened back then. I can't change then. I can't change the fact that I was working to take care of my family. I can't change the fact I was building and developing the business that called me, that God had called me to build. But now as teenagers, I'm with them now. As, at 12 and 16, I'm here now. I take them to school every day now, right? I cook dinner for them every day now. I love and nurture them now. So that's what I started telling the enemy. Well, I can't change that. But I can change today. I can change how I treat them today. I can change what I do today. I can be a better mom today. I can be a better sister today. I can be a better friend today because today was, this is the only gift I have. I can't go back and change those things, right? So when the enemy starts trying to come and remind you of your past, tell them that what is written, that this is what the, what, what the word of God says about me. This is what's, what I read and what is written. And when you give him that, he has to flee, right? Because he don't want to hear the word. And what does it say? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Even the, de the demons tremble at the, word of, at the name of Jesus. Even the demons fear Jesus. Even the demons fear God. So why don't we put them on the run? You ain't putting me on the run. No, you going. You going to be the one running, right? You going to come one way, but you're going to flee seven. That's what it says in the word. So tell him, no, you came this way by the front door, but you're going to flee seven times the front, the back, the left. You out of here. Glory to God. We have to begin to use our power and our power is the word of God. Amen. So we're in Matthew 4 and 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings of kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. People have done that. And they don't even realize they're worshiping the enemy. Amen. But now Christ came. Christ died, risen, rose from the grave, seated at the right hand of God, coming back in glory to judge the living and the dead. I don't need to bow down to you. You don't have anything you can give me. I've already been promised everlasting life, right? I've already been saved, sanctified, filled with ye Holy, Holy Ghost, and promised everlasting life. So what is it the enemy could promise you that you would possibly want? Amen? So this is what Jesus said to him. 
Jesus said to him in Matthew 4 and 10, away from me, Satan, with an exclamation mark. Get away from me. I ain't got time for you, right? But sometimes pe believers don't do that. I don't want to say we or you. I don't want to speak that over anybody. Hey, Tosh, I love you. Hey, Carmelita. Sometimes, hey, Kelly, we don't do that, right? So, I just said we. Sometimes people don't do that. So when the enemy says, you can't do this. Do this and I'll do that. Do this and I'll give you this. Do this and this will happen. Instead of us saying, away from me, Satan. Depart from me. I'm not trying to hear it. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. Keep, keep it moving. Sometimes people entertain the thoughts. And sometimes people entertain the promise. And sometimes people entertain the way. I was watching this movie last night. It was one of my favorite movies. So just the fact about Garlinda. I love Oh Brother Where Art Thou. That is my favorite movie. One of them of all times. The other one's Gladiator. Right, but I love Oh Brother Where Art Thou because of the spiritual symbolism of it, right? And so here it is, there was a guy, there was a um, young man in the movie that sold his soul to the devil because the devil promised him he would be the best guitar player, right? So when they asked him what he was doing at a crossroad because he was in the middle of two roads and there was no houses in sight, the guy said to him, now these guys had just been baptized and they asked the guy, what, how do you find yourself out here at these crossroads? When there's not a, a house for miles in sight. And he said, well, I met the devil out here because I told him, he told the devil he was going to sell him his soul so he could be the best guitar player. Right? And so maybe people don't do it that boldly. Right? They just call Satan and say, hey, you know, got a soul for sale in exchange for blah, blah, blah. But their behavior begins to mimic the fact that they've sold out to the enemy. They're lack of integrity begins to show that they've sold out to the enemy, right? Their lack of moral compass begins to show that they've sold out to the enemy. Glory to God. And so it may not be something that's blatant of this young man on the movie saying he sold his soul. Now they all got saved in the end, but nevertheless, it, it does our behavior in any way mimic that we've sold out some portion of our moral compass, our integrity, our ethics, whatever it is, to the enemy in exchange for something that he promised us, but we thinking it was the God promised it to us. We got to check ourselves in that. Amen. So Matthew 4 and 10, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Glory to God. Then 4, 11, it says, then the devil left him. He couldn't get anything from Jesus, so he left him, right? So it says in Matthew 4 and 11, Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. But the, the message, right? I didn't get to type it in because God changed it before I sat down. Thank God he changed it on Facebook and not in a live preaching setting, right? Even though the Lord does that. <laughs> like, take the will of Jesus and drive fast. But what he said was, what, what happens after a wilderness experience? See, a lot of times we're just so glad to get out of the wilderness. We don't know it. We don't expect anything, right? We're like, God, thank God I made it to the light. Thank God I made it to the end of darkness, right? Thank God I made it out of that wilderness situation. But what happened at the end of Jesus' wilderness experience? What could potentially happen at the end of yours? Right? So I just want you to think about it. Okay, Lord, what do you have for me at the end of my wilderness experience? Especially if you're just coming out or in it and heading out or already out. What do I get from going through that? Right? I mean, not like a gumball machine. Like, what do I get? But what, what should the expectation be? Right? So it says in Matthew 4 and 12, Jesus begins his ministry. So after he went through 40 days and 40 nights of fasting in the wilderness, and after he went through all that time of being tempted by the enemy, didn't eat, had to go through all these different temptations, and now he comes out and it says, Jesus preaches in Galilee, right? So I'm just read a little bit of it. It says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Glory to God. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Good God Almighty, right? So I'm going to stop right there. So when you think about what can come out of a wilderness experience? What can come out of a temptation experience when the enemy is taking you through all types of temptation and saying, if you do this, I'll do that. Nobody will know. If you give up this, if you give me this, I'll give you that. Nobody will know. When you begin to go through all these temptations and it seems like it's just coming back to back to back to back, right? Know that God is setting you up for something great because look what happened when Jesus came out of his 
40 days and 40 nights out of his wilderness experience as he was led into the desert by the spirit. So we can't, we don't need to blame the enemy when the Lord takes us to our testing and he's not testing us, right? But he allows the enemy to test us. Don't blame God when he decides to lead us by the spirit into a place of wilderness or a place of desert experience, because what's the good part that's going to come out is for a reason. It doesn't always feel good going through it. I have to honestly say that, right? And you probably know that as well too. Like what well, Jesus, this show don't feel good, <laughs> right? But he defeated him with the word. Glory to God. So there's a way of escape. That's what the, the Bible talks about all the time. There's a way of escape. So the way of escape is through the word of God. Amen. So it says, after the wilderness experience in Matthew 4 and 11, then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. It says, angels like those who waited on, like these who waited on Jesus have a significant role as God's messengers. These spiritual beings were involved in Jesus' life on earth by announcing Jesus' birth to Mary, reassuring Joseph, naming Jesus, announcing Jesus' birth to the shepherds, protecting Jesus by spending time, um, by sending his family to Egypt, ministering to Jesus in Gethsemane, and it goes on, right? So what can you expect coming out of your wilderness experience? Here, Jesus began his ministry. So ask God, God, what, what is going to happen? What is the great thing? What is the excellent thing? What should my expectation be coming out of my wilderness experience? So just know that it's something great. Just know that it's something good. God doesn't allow us to go through tests and trials for no reason at all. I shouldn't say God doesn't test us. God doesn't tempt us. I might have that wrong, but you got to check it out for yourself. So here it is. He allows us to be tested. But what is the end result? The end result is something good. Jesus came out and began his ministry. In addition to that, four fishermen followed Jesus. That's another story for another day. But this is when Jesus walks beside the Sea of Galilee and calls Peter and Andrew. Right? And here it is. We already know that Peter is the rock of the church. So what good things can come out of your desert experience? What good things can happen when the spirit leads you out into the wilderness? What good things, right? Look or look at Ezekiel when he was led out into the wilderness, led out into the valley by the same spirit of the sovereign God. When he led him out there, he blessed him to prophesy and to speak over dead bones. We talked about that last week. So what, what will come from your wilderness experience? What will come when you're led out? into the valley when you allow yourself to be led out because God is a gentleman. He's not just going to grab you and be like, okay, I'm sending you right here. When you say, Lord, your will and not mine, when you say yes and I mean yes, or you say yes and you mean yes, you don't really know all the time what, what's on the other side of the s, right? <laughs> the ye part is right. It's the s part. It's like when you finish it, it's like, okay, I don't know that this is what I signed up for, right? So let's just pray right quick. So Father, we just come humbly before you. We ask for forgiveness of our sins and thought and word and deed. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity to serve you on today. We give your name the highest praise, which is a hallelujah. God, thank you for teaching us and training us on today that all we have to do to overcome and defeat the enemy is to give him your word back, right? It is written in your word and it is also written. And God, I thank you that you've given us power over every unclean spirit. You've given us the power to tread on the heads of serpents and to cast out devils in your name. And God, I thank you that on today we begin to walk in that authority. And God, I thank you that we don't despise the testing period, that we don't despise the desert period. I thank you, God, that we don't despise the wilderness experience. And God, just bless us to be spiritually strong, spiritually mature, and spiritually aware of when we're in those situations, God, so that we would know our way out. So, so we would know our way out. So we would be able to hide your word in our heart like David, that we might not sin against you and that we would give a right answer and a correct answer when it's required. And God, I just thank you on today that you're bringing everyone through their wilderness experience and that you're bringing everyone out of their desert experience. And God, that they're going to come out with power, that they're going to come out anointed. They're going to come out new. They're going to come out refreshed. They're going to come out different. And God, I thank you that even now you're sending your ministering angels and, and your ministering spirits to attend to your servants that have been in a dry place. And God, we call forth rain on the land of those that are listening, God. Those that stand in need on today in their health, in their body, in their finances, in their jobs, in their ministries, in their wealth, and anything that is, is of a need to them, God. We thank you for being the answer and for sending your messengers on today. Let nothing be held up, God. And anything that I fail to pray, let it not fail to be granted, God, based on their prayer their faith, their belief, and our petition together, God. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So I better hang up before the phone hangs up on y'all. <laughs> so anyway, I love you. God bless you. I'm excited to see what good stuff is coming out of 
the fact that you've already come out or are heading out of your desert experience and the things that God will use you to do in the earth realm and in the spirit realm. God bless you. I'm Pastor Garlanda Price with Common Ground Ministry and I pastor with my honey bunny, Pastor Marvin Price, my lamb chop, and we are outreach pastors. So people always ask us, where's your church? Wherever we are, right? So let's erect the altar right here because we are the church, right? So wherever the Lord sends us, there lies our church. So tonight at seven, unless something changes, we'll be doing Bible study tonight like we do every every Tuesday at 7 p.m. So God bless you. If you're not busy, join us. We'd love to have you on here with us. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys.